I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Zach Zemke, from the Seattle firm NK Architects. One of the words describing Zach's job at NK is evangelism. And I'm guessing we will see that trait as he tells us today about the possibilities of low energy building design in confronting climate change. Zach earned his BA from Stanford, majoring in human biology with a concentration in human ecology. His first professional job was as a staffer with the Coalition for a Livable Future, a Portland-based group of smart growth advocacy organizations. And while in Portland, he then co-led the performing arts group Portland Taiko, meaning drum. You may have seen him. He toured up here to the Mount Baker Theater and was a leading performer for the group. In 2007, he earned a graduate degree in design from the Landscape Institute at Harvard's Arnold Arboretum. And eventually, he joined Hammer and Hand as an evangelist, there's that word again, to broadcast the builder's work on passive housing. Zach has been a sought out speaker on climate change and the role of high performance building, delivering the keynote addresses at the American Passive Conferences in 2015 and 2016. So if you're ready for a bit of passionate preaching, we hope, please welcome Zach Zemke. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jane and, and the board and the membership of the City Club and all of you for being here today. I'm really excited to share these ideas with you and um, to talk about buildings, swans, and the power of arithmetic. So, what I'll be exploring with you today is, is the climate crisis and kind of the dire nature of that crisis, but also the potential for meaningful climate action and the role that buildings can play in that climate action and the role really that the, the buildings need to play um, for us to re reach our collective climate goals. So I want to call out a little bit um, the Climate Reality Project. This is Al Gore's project. Um, and he, Al, Al Gore presents climate leadership trainings um, around the world. And in, at the end of June, there's a training in Bellevue, uh, which I highly recommend. And I understand that Seth here is, is a mentor. Seth is a, is a fellow um, climate reality leader. One of the cool things about being minted a climate reality leader is that you have access to Al Gore's fantastic slides. So I'll be, I'll be uh, sharing a few of those with you today. So I want to, um, oh, and, and a, a bit about NK Architects. We believe that building can be a form of climate action and that the built environment needs to be part of the clean energy transition. And we can do that if we can create, design, and construct zero carbon buildings that are market viable. So that's what, we're, what, what we aim to do. And, I'll, and we'll talk a little bit more in detail about um, the potential for passive house to make that happen. All right, so I'm gonna start with a quick um, view of our collective family album and just look at a couple of photos of our, of our home. So there's Earthrise. This was taken, this photo I think is the most reproduced photo in human history, I understand. And it was taken on uh, Christmas Eve 1968 from the Apollo 8 mission. This was taken by um, a, the astronaut who was in the command module um, orbiting the moon. And it's the first image of Earth from deep space. So it's a, it was really important. Um, it had a very uh, profound cultural impact and really kind of laid the emotional uh, foundation for the environmental movement and for the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, um, for the EPA, all things that we have taken for granted until recently. <laughs> yeah. So a few years later, um, in, in 1972, this photo, the blue marble, was taken by the last Apollo mission. And um, this is the first image of the Earth with the entire surface um, illuminated by the sun. So you can see the, the um, Antarctic um, ice sheet there, and you can see at the continent of Africa and into um, Saudi Arabia. 
And this, this was a, a special um, photo because the uh, sun and the, and the moon and the earth were all lined up just right so that when the rocket was heading toward the moon, they could look back and get this view of the planet. And, and it really you know, demonstrates uh, the, the, the lack of boundaries between countries and the fact that we're all in it together here. This is, I think, pretty striking. This is 1990, a photo or a, a montage video of the Earth in rotation taken by the Galileo spa spacecraft during a flyby. And you can, um, you can see the reflection of the sun on the oceans, which I think is pretty cool. And finally, this is the last photo I want to show you of our home. This is um, the, the sunrise as seen from the International Space Station. And that thin blue line that you see is our atmosphere. Now, if you're like me, you assume that the atmosphere is huge and vast because we look up at the sky and it looks big. But in reality, if the Earth were an apple, the atmosphere is as thin as the skin on that apple. Yet we're pumping in 100 million tons of carbon pollution into that very thin and fragile layer, life-sustaining layer every day. And that's having an impact, of course, on the chemistry of our, of our um, atmosphere. This is showing annual emissions over time, and we, we've had an accelerating problem. It's interesting, though, that that's actually flat right there, so that's encouraging. <laughs> hey, you gotta, you gotta take it where you can here at this point. <laughs> so the, the heat that's trapped by those greenhouse gases is equivalent to the detonation of 400,000 atomic bombs, uh, Hiroshima-class bombs, every day. So that, that's a lot of heat right there, and that's multiplied 400,000 times every single day of the year. So that's, you know, it's impacting our Earth, and we know that we, we, we're beginning to see some pretty profound changes going on. This shows the temperature from 1850 to today, and you can see that it's pretty stable for a while there, kind of ebbs and flows, and then in the 1900s gets going. And it's a pace of change that I think is, has people alarmed. All right. Okay. Good. I'm glad, I'm glad I, was, I was worried that the pointer was going to die right there, and that would be really depressing. So to understand the nature of the climate crisis, as well as the nature of the climate solutions that we have at hand, I want to start with this fable, and it's probably a fable that many of you have heard about. It's that of chess, the chessboard, and rice. So this is how it goes. Back in ancient India, there was a king named King Shiram who was very pleased with his subject, Sisa. Sisa had invented the game of chess, and the king loved to play this game. Um, and so he went to Sisa and he said, hey man, I love chess, and I just, I want to appreciate, you know, show my appreciation, name your reward. And Sisa said, okay, you know, I am a simple man. I would just like some rice. And since you love chess so much, why don't we use the chess board to determine how much rice I will be rewarded. So we'll start with one grain of rice on the first square, and then two on the second, and then four, and then eight, and then 16, and so on. How does that sound? And, and the king said, oh my, that's wonderful. This, I, you know, I, this is such a modest proposal. Of course, your wish is granted. And he went to his ministers and said, please um, go do your math in the calculating room, do your calculations, and we'll figure out how much rice we're going to give this guy. So they did their, their you know, initial math, and they got up to 128 grains of rice on the eighth square, plus 128 minus 1, so it's n minus 1, for the rest of the squares on the board, adding up to 255 squares, or grains of rice. So I'd like to pause for a moment and, and ask you, you obviously, we're, this is exponential change. Um, you can see where this is headed. If you could just like, think to yourself, where, the, where this is going, and give your best educated guess here of where we're headed here. And just think, think about it to yourself. What is this number going to be? All right. Don't, don't, tell, don't, don't spoil it for your neighbors if you know the answer. But. <laughs> okay, so the calculators did their calculations in their, in their back room there, and by the end of the first half of the chessboard, they were already up to 2 billion 
grains of rice on this square, plus the 2 billion grains of rice on the rest of the board, meant 4 billion grains of rice um, by, by the end of the first half of the chessboard. Now, at this point, the ministers got a little worried because they knew where this was headed, and they were concerned about what the king's reaction was going to be. Um, but they had a job to do, so they got back to their work, and they kept on doing their calculations. And after much toil, they got up to nine quintillion grains of rice by the 64th square. Plus the nine quintillion grains of the rice on the rest of the board is 18 quintillion grains of rice, which there's the, the specific number right there. Um, and that's 1,000 times the global rice production in 2010. <laughs> if you piled up all that rice, it would be as, as um, tall as Mount Everest. And there, there are a couple of of uh, versions of the end of this story. One is that the king was so impressed by the, the, the by Sisa's wisdom and understanding um, of the power of exponential growth that he appointed him his right-hand man. And the other version, of course, is that he had him executed. <laughs> but in either case, the, um, the, the, the moral of the story is twofold. One is that exponential change has tremendous power um, so that you can go from one grain of rice to Mount Everest in just 63 doublings. The other is that it's really hard for us as humans to understand and to grok that power, that nonlinear change is non-intuitive. And that it's, if when you were guessing that number, you know, to think that it was actually nine quintillion probably seemed extreme, which brings me to this. The Province of Mediocristan versus Extremistan. This comes from the book, The Black Swan. It's a great book if you haven't read it. And it's by this author, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And he proposes in this book that, there are two, that you can organize um, social and natural phenomena in these two provinces. There's no value judgment as to which province is better or worse. They just are governed by different laws. So this is... The, the, the realm of mediocristan. This is one that we know really well because our everyday experience is governed by the laws of mediocristan, usually. So human height belongs in mediocristan. Human height is predictable. It's characterized by slow, gradual, linear growth. Um, it's egalitarian. So you, you, you don't see big winners and big losers in this world. You don't see a four-foot-tall person next to an 800-foot-tall person. Um, and it's also easy to understand with a very small sample size. So an alien could swoop down to the earth and, and measure the height of five human adults and have a really good picture of the height of, of the seven billion other humans on the planet. So this is gradual slow change, linear, and mild. Extremistan, on the other hand, is wild. So we, here we have Bono, the uh, singer with the, the band U2, and a busker, a street musician, playing for tips. Now, ostensibly, these two musicians are equally talented. Um, but the salary that these guys get is crazy different. So Bono brought in $108 million of revenue last year. So I attempted, I made guesses about how much a busker makes. So these, these uh, bars, they, they, they're not lines, those are bars, are buskers, you know, 40,000 maybe if they're really successful, 10,000 if they're maybe, you know, I don't know. And then a, a Seattle Symphony violinist here, I'm guessing $120,000. They don't even register here because there's this huge disparity. And that's because Extremistan is a world where you have big winners and big losers. And you have, you have giants among a sea of dwarves. So this is um, the, the realm of, or the profession of, mu of musician was not always in Extremistan. It used to be in Mediocristan. Back in the day, back 150 years ago, if you were an opera singer, you could be the most famous opera singer in the world. But you had to show up for work every night to earn your keep. Um, and um, that's just the way it was. But that changed the moment that recording technology came onto the scene. And suddenly you could go and you could step up in front of a microphone and sing an aria for five minutes. That aria could be cut onto a record and then 
replicated a thousand times, million times, distributed around the world and sold. And you could then leverage through technology, you could leverage that five minutes of work for exponential return. Um, it's also, Extremistan is also a world, so, so when that happened, the profession of musician became, um, it, belo it belonged in Extremistan. It's really difficult to understand Extremistan with a small sample size, because if you accidentally, and you could easily accidentally miss this, this part of the sample, then you would be missing out on a, a fundamental um, truth about the profession of, of musician. Finally, um, Extremistan is unpredictable. So nobody would have predicted that when Bono was 15, they, they, nobody would have predicted that when he was in, um, a middle-aged man that he'd be making $108 million singing for U2. So this is a black, the, the black swans believe, belong in Extremistan. I think we're missing a little bit of it. No, no we're not. Okay, so this all applies to the climate crisis in this way. The last 400,000 years, we've never risen above 300 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. Never that is until about right here, uh, a few decades ago, and then we blew past 300, then 350, now 400. And this exponential spike is a, um, is a black swan. This is, this is in extremistan territory and belong and is governed by those laws. So one of the things that's, that's scary about the climate crisis is that it is full of vicious cycles. So these are positive feedback loops that have really negative consequences. The first one I learned about in the late 80s was that of the albedo effect. So albedo is how reflective the Earth is. So the more, that the, earth, the more of the Earth's surface that is covered in ice, the more reflective it is, and therefore the more of the sun's energy is reflected off the surface as light. Well, when the Earth warms, the ice melts, more of the energy from the sun is absorbed as heat energy, and the Earth warms more, more ice melts, more is absorbed, and that has the potential to become um, a runaway situation. Okay, another scary one. Um, methane and the permafrost. So um, there is a lot of methane currently frozen in the permafrost. And while methane is a um, shorter lived uh, greenhouse gas than CO2, it is much more potent. So the way this one works is the, meth the permafrost melts, some of the methane is released, the earth warms, more permafrost melts, and that has the potential to run away. Last one, I'm only gonna do three. Um, this one, if, maybe you've heard of people talking about the potential for multi-meter sea level rise in this century. Um, the reason for that is that um, uh, Jim Hansen and um, a number of other uh, leading climate scientists have discovered this process by which when ice melt water pools at the poles, it triggers an exponential process of breaking up ice sheets. And when that happens, more ice melts, which means that more melt water pools of the pores, poles, which means that more ice sheets break up, and that has the potential to run away. All right. So we know we need to do something about, it, about this. And probably most of you have seen some version of this idealized graph here showing what we need to do with greenhouse gas emissions from today through to 2050. So, and we also know that if we wait, it makes our job harder. That if we wait for the peak year, the peak year is higher, it means we have to make up for lost time and um, work a lot faster. The arithmetic of all this is very simple, actually, and that's this equation. So, and we know from elementary um, math that if we want the product here to be zero, then one of these needs to be zero too. Well, Population is going to go is going to increase in the next few decades. It's uh, expected to increase to about nine billion. We're at we're at seven billion now. It'll be at nine billion in a, in a couple of decades. Um, if we care about economic development and seeing uh, you know hundreds of millions of people who are currently in poverty rise out of poverty, then we hope that GDP per capita will go up. Um, so that puts a lot of pressure on these guys. So energy intensity needs to go down, and energy efficiency can do that, and certainly building efficiency can do that. And 
carbon intensity needs to go down. So our energy needs to get cleaner. We need to move away. We can move away from fossil fuels toward renewable energy and make that go get really small. And then we can get to where we want to go. This is called the Kaya identity, named after um, Yoichi Kaya, the economist who, who came up with it. So some of you may not realize, but the most um, significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in the United States are our buildings. Um, so 41% of greenhouse gas emissions come from our buildings. Some of that is construction of our buildings, but most of it is operating our buildings. So heating and lighting and cooling our buildings and plugging in computers and stuff. Um, and then that's followed by industry and then transportation. And I want to take a moment um, here. I'm going to be mainly focused on building, uh, on energy performance of buildings. But what, one of the things that's also really important is um, how we create and shape our towns and cities. So by moving away from patterns of, urban, of suburban sprawl towards denser, more traditional neighbor, neighborhoods that are more walkable and bikeable and, and, and um, accessible to transit, that has a big impact on this, this um, piece. It drives that down because we're, we're not driving around as much. Also, if we um, encourage more apartment buildings and, and um, you know, larger buildings, those are inherently more efficient than single family houses because we're sharing walls between uh, interior walls with other dwellings. So those are, I just wanna point, point that out that, it's, that, I, that I'm talking about buildings, but you know, the building form, the form of our cities is also really key. All right. So buildings are part of the problem, then therefore buildings can be part of the answer. That's what we tell ourselves as architects and builders. So, and we can take stuff like, you know, use approaches like passive house, which I'll talk about in a little bit here, that reduce energy use by as much as 75%. And that's before solar panels. So you, you do passive house and then you add solar panels to your building, you can have a net zero energy building or a net positive energy building, and you can do it in a cost effective and practical way. So, you know, we can be part of the solution. And we look, and here are some principles of passive house. This is a science proven method toward design that um, was refined in Germany by a physicist who decided that um, it was time to bring you know, buildings up to snuff. So it focuses a lot on the building envelope, we call it, the outside of the building, air bar uh, a great air barrier, continuous insulation, high performance windows. These things, heat recovery ventilation, these are really great gizmos that deliver a constant supply of filtered fresh air to uh, interior spaces, but do it in a way that captures the heat energy and, and, and retains it inside the building, or the cool energy in summer. Um, no thermal bridging, this is a, that's a wonky term, um, so I'm not gonna go into it, but this is, it's really careful detailing to make sure that you're not wasting energy through um, elements of the building that poke through the thermal layer, through the insulation. Um, seasonal shading to make sure that you're managing this passive solar gain in your building. And then you can add optional solar panels and get net zero energy. So you're now passive house experts. I don't want to hear any questions about passive house. <laughs> All right. So this, and so we look at examples like this and feel, you know, good and like excited. This is the Cornell Tech camp campus that's under construction right now on Roosevelt Island in New York City. And uh, this building is the world's tallest passive house as a dormitory. Um, it will be eclipsed soon after it's completed by another um, taller building in Europe. So we look at this, it's a shining example of what we can, what we can accomplish. Um, we, can, you know, we, can make, we can make a difference. And then Paris, ah, oh, Paris. Um, you know, there's, there was a lot of momentum going on around um, global climate action. There still is a lot of um, momentum going on um, despite our intransigence. Um, only two countries in the world did not sign on to the Paris Agreement, and that's Syria and Nicaragua. So, you know, we're, we're, we're going in the right direction. But then this thing happened in November, and I think it's, I, I think it's been... And it's rattled many of us, maybe not all of us, and that's fine. But certainly it's rattled me. Anybody who really is worried about the climate crisis, you know, you, it certainly gives you pause. So we see questions like this. Is this game over for the planet? Um, I have three kids. Uh, this is a tough question. 
Um, and then this is a you know kind of graphic reminder of what we're up against. This is the largest coal port in China. And it's, it's a reminder of the skin in the game that fossil fuel companies have, right? Um, they have, the fossil fuel companies, coal and oil companies have trillions of dollars of assets currently in the ground. What's to stop them from just digging it all and drilling it all and burning it? And if that's the case, what's the point? We're just fooling ourselves with all of these passive houses and net zero energy buildings and all this climate action. It's just, we're de delaying the inevitable. If we, if we burn it all, that's uh, 10 degrees Celsius warming and all the ice melts and the, the sea level rises by 200 feet and it's apocalyptic. So is it time for us to run to the hills and huddle in our passive house compounds with our guns? <laughs> uh, I don't think so, not yet anyway. And this is, I'm gonna start the story for why I don't think so here. I wanna start by saying that I'm not pretending that everything's gonna be okay. There's a lot of uncertainty embedded in all of this. But I do wanna make the case that this is a battle that is winnable and that together we can prevail. All right, so 1,001 days in the life of a turkey. This comes from the Black, the Black Swan book that I, that I mentioned earlier. And um, you know, the, the turkey's born on day one and he's got it good. He's got clean water, he's got great food, um, he's got a free range that he can free range around. And you know, it's, good, it's a good life. And uh, you know, there's little ups and downs, but he basically knows what's coming every day and he's getting fatter and happier every day. And with every passing day, he becomes more convinced that he understands the boundary conditions of his life. He understands you know, this is my life, I've got it figured out, I'm good. He's operating in mediocristan. Gradual, slow growth, what could go wrong? <laughs> Un unfortunately for a turkey, uh, Thanksgiving belongs in mediocris, or in, in extremistan, excuse me. So on day 1001, the ax comes down, the feathers are plucked, and the turkey is served for Thanksgiving dinner. And it's that event, the event that the turkey could not or would not see coming, that swooped in and changed everything for that turkey. It's that event that is the black swan event. And um, the, the author of the black swan says and makes the case that many of the turning points in human history can be described using this image. So uh, a, a, a famous one is 9-11 or the fall of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the Soviet, Soviet Union. Or it can be used to describe ecosystem collapse. So coral reefs, for example, could absorb stress over time and stress, and, and then finally, boom, um, everything falls apart seemingly overnight. It can be used to describe social change as well. So the coming of marriage equality or the election of the first black president or the election of Donald Trump. So we're talking about events that are both positive and, ne and negative. But in, in all cases, a black swan event comes in and disrupts what all the experts thought could not happen. Like everybody thinks that they understand the system, this thing comes in and poof, we were all wrong. So shortly after I read this book, I came across this image. And man, it looks a lot like a black swan. So this comes from Alliance Bernstein. They're a global asset management firm that's in charge of managing about a half trillion dollars in assets. Um, and so they're sober folks, but they entitled this graph, Welcome to the Terror Dome, in their report to their energy investors, because they recognize that something big is afoot here. So down along the bottom, we see the wavering lines of the status quo. Those, that's the price of energy provided by fossil fuels, so oil, gas, liquefied natural gas, um, and coal. And then out of nowhere comes crashing down solar energy. So before 2007, solar energy was way too expensive to even show up on this graph at all. In 2007, it shows up and then just free falls, and by 2013 and 2014, solar energy is challenging fossil fuel on price without subsidy. This is for emerging Asian markets, but the same basic um, processes at work around the world right now. 
And what Alliance Bernstein is sa says in this report is that they expect for this trend to continue because solar energy is a technology, not a fuel. That's true for wind energy as well. So innovation drives price down. Now, many of you probably have heard of Moore's Law, which says that, says that every couple of years, the number of transistors you can fit on a computer chip doubles. Moore's Law describes the exponential increase in the power of computing and the equally rapid decrease in the cost of that power. In the solar space, we have something very similar. It's called Swanson's Law. It's also, importantly, known as the learning curve law. And what it says is that for every doubling of solar capacity deployed around the world, that we see a 22 to 24% decrease in the cost of solar panels. So this is what that's done to price of solar. So from 1976 to today, there's been a 99.5% decrease in the cost of solar panels. And this trend continues. So Alliance Bernstein, kind of amazingly, it's not just Alliance Bernstein, actually, it's Bloomberg New Energy Finance as well, Carbon Tracker Initiative, and others are saying that solar will begin to drive fossil fuel price down. Now, for those of you who have been engaged in renewable energy over the years, the, the power dynamic has always been the other way around. So when, when fossil fuel price goes up, you go, all right, that's great. Renewable energy might be um, competitive. And when it goes down, it's like, oh, that's a bummer for renewable energy. Well, what this is saying is that that power dynamic is about to flip on its head, and solar is going to be pulling price for fossil fuels. Now, we need to wait until solar is 10 times larger right now in, in, around the world. It's too small of a pie right now, a piece of the pie. Well, you know, if you're like me and somebody says, oh, wait until it increases by 10 times, you're like, okay, get back to me when that happens. Um, but that's what's happening with PV installations around the world. So this is totally exponential growth. PV around the world has been doubling every two years consistently for about three decades. Um, and if you're wondering if we're in black swan territory, this is a really interesting image. So this, this shows the actual um, increase in solar. And these flat lines right here are estimate after estimate or projection after projection after projection by the world's leading experts on energy, the International Energy Agency. They are unable to accept or understand that we are seeing exponential change. And year after year, they predict flat growth. And it's because they're used to energy as being a linear, um, gradually changing kind of mediocre stand thing. They're, they're operating in mediocristan, but solar energy is a technology and it belongs in extremistan. All right, so let's look at the projections versus reality. In 2002, the projection was that by 2010, we'd see ener the solar energy market grow by one gigawatt per year. The reality is that we exceeded that by 17 times by 2010. Check this out. 70 times by 2016. And... Um, it should be 77 times this year. And in the United States, we doubled solar capacity last year. So all, that's, we, doubled, we doubled solar capacity last year. So, so there, are, there are reasons to be um, frustrated and, sty and feel stymied and scared about the political situation about, around climate. But meanwhile, there are powerful forces that are working um, to that we can harness to help address this issue. All right, so the, one of the exciting things that's going on right now is that the center of gravity around this clean energy revolution is moving more and more to the developing world. Um, and so I want to share an example from Chile. And in some ways, it's not really fair to share a solar example from Chile because it has incredible access to the sun, great insulation, as they say. Um, but much of the developing world also has really good access to solar, so it's not entirely unfair. Um, so here's what's going on there. In 2000, at the end of 2013, they had a very modest 11 megawatts installed. Then they had 402, which is, you know, it's a start. Actually, Mexico City's new airport will have a 400 megawatt um, solar array installed as part of that project, which is really cool. Um, then the next year, they doubled it, so that's, that's a good trend. 
Here's what's happening now. Yeah. I have to thank Al Gore for that slide. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> so this is just one country, and 13 gigawatts is substantial, but, but it's a small number compared to global, the global need. But if we can see that this kind of growth more and more around the world, then we're going to be making, a ma we're going to make, be making real headway. And this isn't about policy right now. This is, I mean, it's partly about policy, but mainly this is about economics. All right, so let's look at wind. Worldwide wind capacity will reach 30 gigawatts by 2010. That's what we figured in 2000. And the reality is that by 2016, we, ex it, we exceeded that goal by 16 times. So wind is also a really great success story. Exponential growth in wind driven by Swanson's law. And um, batteries have been a huge deal. Uh, batteries from 2006 to 2016, look at that, that decrease. I mean, it's, it's uh, that's basically an order of magnitude lower in a decade. Um, and that's making things like electric vehicles and grid storage and home storage doable. So here we see, and we're building on the lithium ion batteries that are in our cell phones. So that's these ones. And then here's vehicle battery growth projected and energy syst storage system batteries growth projected. So according to Bloomberg, solar plus batteries is set to begin a dramatic transformation of human civilization. That's quite a quote. All right, so Tesla, as you know, probably you've heard about the Gigafactory. They're still building this Gigafactory, but they're also already producing batteries out of this factory. And so this, the, the, this big um, grid battery storage facility in California came from the Tesla factory. They were able to, they were able to build it in a few weeks. And um, so they're storing the excess uh, solar energy from the middle of the day and using it in early evening um, when uh, the sun is, is down and they're able to eliminate the need for very carbon intensive, intensive and expensive um, gas powered, peak, what they call peaker plants. So this is a really important piece of the, of the energy, the renewable energy grid puzzle. We're also seeing exponential increase in, in global electric vehicle sales, which I'll get to in a little bit. So while the International Energy Agency might be surprised by this, it doesn't take the, it doesn't take any technologist by surprise because technologists know about this S curve of technology uptake. That bell curve is charting the inv innovators, early adopters, early majority. Th these are us, the, those of us who decide when to adopt a new technology. That pattern of adoption drives this period of exponential increase that then levels off to 100% market share. And that kind of curve and exponential change is seen time and time again with, te with successful technologies. So dishwashers, VCRs, air conditioning, cell phones, internet use, clothes dryers, all of them have some v version, sometimes it's a little squiggly, but they have some version of that, um, that S-curve of technology uptake. So there's that S-curve. And remember, I showed you what needs to happen with emissions you see, is there a relationship there? Yeah, so, so the point is that this could come in handy with addressing um, the problem that we have um, in front of us. Okay, so Alliance Bernstein says that solar will drive fossil fuel price down. Why does that matter? Um, aren't they just gonna burn, all, burn it all anyway? Aren't we all doomed? So the answer to that question has to do with the concept of stranded assets. A stranded asset for a fossil fuel company is oil, coal, or gas that they have on their books that's currently in the ground that they cannot extract. Either for moral imperative, we say enough is enough, no more fracking, or for um, just because of market forces, that a given resource is too expensive to extract for the price that the company can get on the market. So um, I'm gonna unpack this chart, bear with me, but there are some cool animations in it, so hopefully you'll be entertained by that. Um, but these, these, um, this text that you can't read, you don't need to read, is that these are the names of a whole bunch of different oil reserves around the world. This is oil price, 
And as you get further and further along this axis, we're going from easy to extract and therefore cheap to extract oil to harder and harder to extract and therefore expensive to, to extract oil and natural gas. This line that goes through it is called the oil cost curve. It's the break-even point for the company. So at this point right here, for instance, anything that is above this point is too expensive to extract for that price. Um, so when this was put together by Citibank in the months leading up to the Paris conference, the price of a barrel of oil had crashed down to $75 a barrel. And at $75 a barrel, all these orange reserves no longer pencil. It's just too expensive to extract those resources at that price. Now since then, the price of, see, the price of a barrel of oil has, has um, um, gone down to uh, $50 a barrel. Actually today it's 54. Um, but it's been hovering around here. It actually went way down here for a little bit, but it's here. So at that price, that calls into question on economic grounds two-thirds of the reserves that we're looking at on this sheet. Now the, yeah, yay is right. And not, not that, that um, oil companies make their decisions to drill or not based on a single day of, of price data, but if this persists, then you know, things are beginning to shift and there's gonna be a lot of write-offs going on. And in fact, huge write-offs have been happening for assets that are currently stranded in the tar sands because of this dynamic. Um, so what's exciting for me as somebody who's in, immersed in um, energy efficiency gen generally, but, es but especially in buildings, is that there's a direct line between the work that we do designing and constructing energy efficient buildings and this graph. Because as we make our built environment more energy efficient, we are, all things equal, reducing demand for energy and therefore for fossil fuels. And we can see that line drag down a little bit and strand a few more assets in the ground. And as we add solar panels to our projects, we are, um, we're part of that Swanson's law that I mentioned. So we're helping to drive the price of solar down. We're also increasing the market muscle of, of renewable energy compared to fossil fuels and we're driving the, the price of fossil fuel down and stranding more assets in the ground. And finally, if we tax carbon or put a price on carbon, then basically what that means is this whole line jumps up and that red dot drags down and we strand even more assets in the ground. Now, this relationship between the price of oil and the decision making that oil majors make with their extraction just played out in our front yard in Seattle with this Shell oil rig. This was in 2015. Um, and they parked it, I think they were doing maintenance before they went up to Alaska. And there was a bunch of really um, important and effective kayaktivism that happened. So you can see the kayaktivists there and they're, they're surrounding and they're making, they're, my, they're making life tough for, for Shell and their work. Shell ended up going, going to the Arctic anyway, but during that, that period, when they, when, they, when they got up there, the price of the barrel of oil was crashing down to that $75 level that I was talking about. And finally, the decision makers at Shell just threw their hands up and said, this is crazy. We cannot, this is way too expensive for us to be doing this work up here for the price that we can get on the market. Not to mention that this Paris conference is about to happen. Who knows what's going to go on there? And we've got these kayaktivists on our backs. So, <laughs> so they announced that they were out of the Arctic for the foreseeable future. And that's currently their stance. So yeah, so there's a direct relationship. All right, so Carbon Tracker Initiative is a really awesome organization. They have a great website and really um, cool um, digestible research that even I can understand. And um, so they, um, th they say, this is their phrase, that Climate security equals fossil fuel demand destruction. It's not the sexiest phrase in the, in the, in the world, but it, it, um, it's a, I think it is a powerful, kind of co a powerful concept. So our role as, um, as citizens of this world is to try to figure out, if we care about climate change, is to try to figure out how to, to, to destroy demand for fossil fuels. So one of the ways that um, I mentioned already was, is through wind and solar and Swanson's Law. 
you know, as we deploy more, it gets cheaper. We deploy more of it, it you know, it just it, that starts to take off and and propels fossil fuel demand destruction. Um, renewables, as renewables gain more market share, I mentioned they have more market muscle, which means that um, the price uh, they have more power to drive the to drag the price of fossil fuels down which can strand more fossil fuels in the ground, which means that there's more, on balance, more market share going on with the renewables, which makes, gives them more muscle, et cetera. So that can propel this, this dynamic. Grid mix shifts. <laughs> so as we deploy more renewable energy and more megawatts from energy efficiency onto our grid, then we are idling conventional power plants more often. And that means that the power that comes from conventional power, power plants is more expensive, which makes renewables and megawatts more attractive, which means we can do more of that, and that can take off. Electric vehicles, as they become more popular, um, we buy more, the, the, the manufacturers respond with R&D, and there's a huge response going on right now in the automotive industry around R&D. Ford just replaced its president with the head of the, e, the EV department. Um, signaling a, a major shift toward EVs. Um, anyway, as, as, they do, as they accelerate R&D, then we see better performance and cheaper cars, uh, cheaper EVs, and um, that starts to take off. And finally, energy efficiency. Simply, as we, get, as we do energy efficiency more, whether it's in buildings or in other, in other areas, we get better, better at it and, it, and it becomes cheaper to do, and that can take off. So these are the virtuous circles and the, ex the exponential power that we can harness to help destroy demand for fossil fuels and, and work toward a secure climate future. So I believe that the world today desperately needs these three things from, from our buildings. We need revolutionary efficiency. We need predictable performance so that um, owners and builders and um, and developers know what they're, and policymakers know what they're getting from buildings, and we need to do all this at little or no added cost. And if we have those three things, then we can see building as climate action truly scale, and that's, that's the task ahead. We need to get, move beyond boutique projects and make this thing scale. So Passive House, I'm going to talk a little bit more. I know you guys are experts, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about Passive House with you. Um, this is Morningside Community Center. This is a project that, we're, that NK is designing in Pittsburgh. It's a, it's, this is a, an 1897 elementary school with a 1929 addition, and this is new construction over here. It's all being done to Passive House. We're retrofitting Passive House. We're doing new construction of Passive House. Um, and it's coming in at below um, average construction cost. So, and the reason for that, thanks, yeah. Um, the reason for that is this, and that is the genius of Passive House is that it understands that the building itself, its skeleton and its skin, is technology. So we're accustomed, when we think about technology in buildings, we're accustomed to think of all the gizmos and stuff that we cram into buildings to make up for the fact that it's, they're crappy buildings, essentially. That's been our mode of uh, building design for the last century since we had access to um, crazy mechanical equipment. Well, what, this, what Passive House does is it says, no, we're going to focus on the envelope of the building and, and create a fantastic building so we don't need all that mechanical stuff that uses up energy. And because it understands the building itself as technology, the same kind of um, innovation that drives performance up and costs down in the clean energy space can then be applied now in this, in this arena. So we're talking about up to 75% less total energy use, predictable performance. These are um, 25 energy efficient buildings in the UK. And it's measuring the thermal performance of the building envelope. So it's, it's walls and, and um, foundation and roof. These three buildings are passive house. So you can see that the prediction, and this is predicted. So the prediction is that the passive house buildings are gonna use a lot less energy. And the actual, is that the passive house buildings use a lot less energy. There's a really close correlation. But look at the, the actual versus uh, predicted on these other buildings. They're all, they're all using more energy than they predicted, and some by a huge margin. So that predictability is really key, um, and it's thanks to the building science that underpins this German style of, of building design. 
Okay, little cost premium. I mentioned the, the success story of the project in the background there. This scatter plot, this, so this is the cost of a project by square foot, and this is the size of a project by square foot. These are 179 proposed projects, and it's scattered across, across you know, all over the place. These are proposed projects to the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency, the PHFA, and those guys are in charge of awarding low-income housing tax credits to affordable housing developers. So if you want to do an affordable housing project, you go, there, you go to these guys and you compete with all your peers to try to get fund, basically to try to get funding. Um, and what they've done in Pennsylvania for the last two years is they're awarding 10 extra credit points for projects that pursue passive house. <laughs> So it doesn't cost the Pennsylvania anything to do this. It's, a, it's free for them. But it sets up this competitive environment where, where these teams are competing against each other and getting a leg up if they can propose a passive house project that pencils. So this is what's going on with construction costs for the passive house projects. You can see they're scattered all over the place. There's no correlation between whether or not a, a, a building is passive house and its construction cost. In this, with these numbers, and so in fact, the the average passive house cost is 171 here, and the average conventional cost is 168 a square foot. They're nearly the same. Um, it's a rounding error, error. It's uh, less than two percent cost premium. So this is U.S. Department of Energy says passive house rocks. So we've got conventional energy star passive house for energy performance. Here's health. Here's thermal comfort, and there's durability. So what is needed to scale? We need better performance at lower cost. Um, and so we need, you know, we need to, we need to um, we've got a real opportunity with Passive House. And because of this, we're seeing exponential increase in Passive House throughout North America. So whether you're talking about square footage, projects, units, these are still small numbers because we're just getting started in North America. Um, but, it, but it's headed in the right direction. And right now, the passive house projects that are currently under construction in North America, the number of units, when those are done, will quadruple the total of, the, of North America. So we're about to do a scale jump um, in the number of projects in, um, in North America. So if you think of passive house adoption and this, this notion of building as climate action, um, at, at adoption of building as climate action, as a, a chemical reaction, We've got all the compounds in place, and it's kind of it's kind of bubbling. It's doing its thing a little, you know. So we we learn to design and build, or we do more passive house buildings. We learn to design and build them better. Construction cost falls. The supply chain responds. We can get better components more locally for a cheaper price. Demand increases as the overall cost falls, and we get more passive house buildings built. That's going on now. That's why we see exponential increase. But this progress is not fast enough right now given the urgency of the climate crisis. So we could really use a catalyst, whether that's policy, you know, policy at, this, at City of Bellingham to incentivize Passive House, or um, any number of tools to, to incentivize and catalyze the adoption of this technology. So, and Brussels is a shining example of this. The City of Brussels, um, between 2005 and 2009, um, did their, um, instated their exemplary buildings program in Brussels, where they gave an incentive for passive house buildings. It was like $10 a square foot. And they incentivized 117 buildings. That was the catalyst. And through those buildings, they sparked this market transformation, where, where um, building occupants started to understand that these were better buildings and that they would rather live in a passive house building than their conventional building. And designers realized that they didn't have to freak out about it, that they could actually make this happen and the tools were doable. And builders learned that they could deliver these projects at or close to construction cost premium and they could make a profit and it was good. So that catalyst result leveraged then the construction of 3,000 passive house buildings in, the, in, in just a few years. And passive house became so commonplace in Brussels that by 2015, Brussels enacted Passive House as building code in the city. So all buildings now need to um, be Passive House buildings. And it was an easy political lift by then because it just made sense. So this is job growth, population growth in Brussels, and energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. 
So you can see that we're seeing a really rapid decrease in, the, in those areas. Um, and this is the kind of graph that we need to see across the board in city after city after city around the globe. So this brings, all this brings me to this, and that is that there, there, I think we're right to decry climate change denialism. Um, you know, the science is clear, 97% of uh, um, consensus around this. And, and the problem with that denialism is that it breeds inaction, and it does so by distorting our understanding of the problem. It says, hey, relax, there is no problem, you know, we're good. But I think we need to be equally vigilant about climate change despair because it also breeds inaction, but it does so by distorting our understanding of the solutions, by saying they're impractical or not cost-effective or they're ineffective or who cares because they're just gonna drill it all out anyway. The reality is that we have solutions at hand today to address this crisis, um, and, and that's where we need to go. So Martin Luther King did not say, I have a nightmare. He said, he, I have a dream. And he described going to the mountaintop and looking to the promised land. And he articulated a vision of an inclusive and just future um, of love. And it was a vision that people could rally around and care about and fight for. And I think that those of us in the who are worried about the climate crisis are really good, about talking, or good at talking about nightmares. Um, and we could get better, and the problem with that, of course, is that people either run away or shut down. And I think we, you know, we, need, to, we need to do a better job with, with um, articulating a future that we want to fight for. So I'm going um, I'm to give it a shot. I, I think that we don't need charismatic leaders to do this. We can do this e each individually. So I'm going to share with you my, my thoughts about 2027, 10 years from now. So tw first of all, 2027 is not perfect. Um, we've seen, uh, year after year, we've seen hotter and hotter temperatures. We've become inured to the headline, hottest year on record. Um, and that's increasing stresses on ecosystems and on society, and, and you know, that, that's hard. And the, um, you know, finally, the Great Barrier Reef has succumbed, and it's, it's gone. So 2027 is not perfect. On the other hand, a few years ago, emissions peaked and have been declining steadily ever since. And passive houses become building code in much of the United States. And, and, not, not, and that's great news for, for the climate. Um, it's also great news um, for occupants, because, building occupants, because we have equitable access to better buildings, to healthy buildings. Em emissions also are expected to start going down rapidly soon uh, because, energy, because solar energy and wind energy and batteries and electric vehicles and passive house have all become the no-brainer in the marketplace because they are cheaper and cleaner and better products than their counterparts. And all of this is you know, providing all of us with hope, but especially the young people. Um, because we're moving away from humans being a drag on the planet and the econo our economy is destroying the planet towards something, some new possibilities. So we're moving beyond these conventional notions of sustainability toward active promotion of nature and restoration of the climate. Okay, so that's, that's, that's my vision for 2027. Does it, did that seem too rosy? <laughs> the reef part kind of sucks. But the other stuff is pretty encouraging. And those, those, the, all, many of those details come from this report from the Alliance Bernstein, that asset management company that is managing half a trillion dollars. They predict that this is what's going to happen with CO2 emissions. Boom. And they do it in this report, Asia Strategy. They say CO2 is going to peak by the end of the decade. Uh, renewables are cheaper than fossil fuels and getting more so still. And uh, what's the last one? No, fossil fuels are a depreciating asset. So the reasons I'll go fast here. China is, it, the, the growth in China is over and it won't be replicated. Um, so the, the combination of China, India, and Brazil, the emissions are going to go down. Um, energy intensity, our, the efficiency of our economies across the board, both developed and developing, are going down quickly. Solar energy is already at cost parity with some fossil fuels, and we'll go cheaper still. Um, solar plus batteries 
is as cheap or cheaper or will be cheaper than grid electricity, retail electricity in 2018 and will, um, in many parts of the world and will get cheaper still. And they say that we have one market with two suppliers. One has a rising cost structure because it is extractive and the other has a falling cost structure because it is technology. And that if you extend that out, it's just, it's, this is all headed in one direction. EVs are, are increasing, uh, are doubling every two years, and, and um, w we will see a peak in gasoline demand and a crash in oil demand, stranding a bunch of assets. Exxon doesn't think so. So Exxon thinks that instead we'll see a rapid increase in emissions and it'll flatten out at a totally unsustainable level and we're all screwed. They don't say that we're all screwed, but that's... So who's right? Is it them? Is it, you know, is it, is it uh, the Alliance Bernstein or is it Exxon? These guys um, did a... Uh, this is the um, Grantham Institute at, at Imperial College London and took a look at all these numbers and said, okay, we have this clean tra energy transition is happening. What implications does that have for global warming? And they found that this transition will get us to 2.4 or 2.65 degrees Celsius, which is great news, but it's not far enough. And they conclude that buildings need to be part of the picture. So we stand, uh, humanity is, at this, um, is in this epic race um, for our survival, in my view. And on one side, we've got the climate crisis and it's full of hairy exponential change that threatens environmental destruction. It's scary. But on the other side, we have climate solutions and they also have exponential power that we can harness. So how do we figure out how to harness that? Um, the Swanson's Law with solar energy and the, and the price curve that's going crashing down, that didn't happen by accident. That happened thanks to innovations made by hundreds of thousands of people, literally hundreds of thousands of people, whether they were physicists, material scientists, uh, manufacturers, con um, contractors, installers, um, policymakers, marketers, you name it, all these people working together to drive down um, and the, the price of solar and drive up its performance. Because we can understand buildings as technology, we can do the same thing in the built environment. And in that, that, in that case, we're talking about designers and architects and builders and installers and subcontractors and manufacturers and window people and all those people working together to drive this, to drive this forward. So the, um, I, I, I'll, and we're part of a sustainable, sustainability revolution that has the, the sweep of the agricultural and industrial revolutions, but the speed of the technology revolution. This is my last slide I wanna share. Carl Sagan requested that this picture be taken um, as the Voyager spacecraft was leaving the solar system. So this was taken in um, 1990, four billion miles away from our planet. This is our planet right there. So one pixel. And it's just a reminder of how precious and um, unique and, uh, the, this Earth is and the, and the responsibility that we have to it as stewards. And all of us, whether we are climate activists or designers or architects or grandparents or um, you know, elected leaders, all have a role to play in securing our future. Thank you. Okay, I think, that, I think that was a call to action. <laughs> um, while our people are getting around, Chuck and Kate over here have the microphones. We have a little time for questions. The one thing I wanted to ask you was, uh, can you retrofit passive or does it have to yeah. be new built? Yeah. Um, so especially, can you retrofit or uh, new build, especially for larger buildings, you can, you can absolutely retrofit. So that project that I showed is actually includes a retrofit of that historic elementary school. It's trickier to retrofit a single family house to the passive house standard, but you can st that doesn't mean that, you, you know, that we can't make big strides with a deep energy retrofit. Jane sort of asked the question I'm going to ask, but I'm gonna ask it again anyway. I own a 150 year old standalone house. Shall we tear it down and start over? No, no, absolutely not. So I think that 
I, I don't know what, what it, um, upgrades you may have, may have not done on your house, but the first thing to do would be to explore air tightness plus one of those HRV units in terms of s saving energy, because air tightness alone, so much energy we lose through our buildings just from leaking air that, that goes out. So, so that would be a place to start if you're interested in, in making strides with your own house. Um, and then insulation, then better windows. Uh, first of all, thank you for not bumming me out. Oh, good. So one Welcome. of the bright spots in a, in a, a approved plan for redevelopment of the waterfront, a, a brownfield site, 50 to 100 acres, depending how much, is that when Seth and I were on the council, we put in policies for district energy. You haven't talked about district energy. This is waste heat recovery and heat transfer. Where does that play in, and what is my best argument for getting us, the city and the port, to pay money ahead of time to put in the infrastructure for district energy? Uh, okay, um, so the, I think that the, the major question about district energy is just looking at the, is looking at the cost analysis and de deciding is that the best use of the dollars or does it make more sense to bring, bring the structure up to a better, a higher level of performance? So that's, you know, there's that. Um, but district energy is, you know, really could be super powerful. And, you know, basically we're looking, trying to figure out how to eliminate waste and it sure makes a lot of sense to, to, um, to uh, scale up to district energy. So for the, for the analysis, how to make the case on, on um, I don't know. I don't know how to make the case. I, I think that, again, it's, a, it's it, because it depends on, it depends on the, um, you know, if, if this is gonna be a return that the city or the investor can realize over time, then it's much easier to make the, ar the argument. Um, you know, so if the, the people who are investing in that upfront expense will realize the benefit of the energy efficiency over time, then you can make the 15. Yeah, so it might, it might work. 15 might work. It would work with buildings. It works with passive house. If you, if you can fund, if, yeah, yeah. I'm involved in a group that is lobbying for a carbon tax, both at the federal and the state level. Are we wasting our time? Should we just let Swanson's Law solve the problem for us? No, absolutely not. That's actually a really good question. Um, and and um, the, the issue with Swanson's Law and with de 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 declining energy is that when energy gets really cheap, are we just going to start using a bunch more of it? Um, and the answer is no, not if we do something like a carbon tax or, an, or something, you know, so, or at least then we move the use of energy away from fossil fuels and to renewables. So a carbon tax is incredibly important and it's especially, um, it's especially important when we are successful at energy efficiency and renewable energy. It gets more and more important um, to, to, because we need to offset that tendency for them to just like, okay, we can just use energy for everything. Yeah. I'd like to go back to your starting circles um, with population. Why are we not talking about population control? We are talking about population. Um, nobody's figured out how to control population without educating girls and investing in um, economic development of, the, of, of developing countries. So, yeah, let's, we, need to, there's this elect, we need to do some electing of people to make that happen, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> I agree. Population is definitely an issue, and unfortunately, that so many of those responses end up being super regressive, and they don't work. And it's the progressive response to population that is the only way that has been shown to actually address the issue, and that's educate women, deal with economic development. Is there a viable alternative to fossil fuel in the near term for air travel? Um, yet, well. It depends on what near term means, but the long term solution could be to, as battery technology improves, to, would be to actually um, incorporate storage into the structure of the plane. So there, we're talking about um, at the wings being, um, you know, storage for renewables. But the more um, immediate thing that people are looking at is figuring out ways to provide liquid fuel that is sustainable. Um, so that you could do that in a couple, I mean, you can do biofuels, although that's fraught. Um, but there's also uh, a power to, power to um, gas and power to liquid fuel um, technologies that take renewable energy um, at peak times when we have too much of it and can transfer it into um, liquid, you know, liquid fuel. So I think that one is more medium term. It's also the way, one of the ways that we're going to deal with intermittency um, during uh, the lack of solar power during winter 
in climates like ours will be some sort of power to gas if we're, look, if we're looking at a real 100% renewable future. Uh, I've heard recently that um, a high percentage, maybe more than half, of the greenhouse gas emissions come from animal agriculture. How does that figure into this whole thing? Um, I don't think it's more than half, but it is really significant. Um, it doesn't figure into buildings, but uh, you know, really. <laughs> Unless we do like big buildings over the, over the flatulence and capture it. And then we could power our planes with it and we'd be in good shape. <laughs> but in all, serious, in all seriousness, it's a serious, I mean, this is an issue and that's why you hear people talking about moving away from beef in their diet, for instance. Um, and also the, the idea of carbon, of, um, moving back to more traditional forms of agriculture, really, and get away from the more mechanized stuff, because um, so much, there is a great potential to sequester carbon in our soils, because healthy, those, that healthy black soil, that's carbon rich, and that's, we, wanna, we wanna see that in our agricultural land um, so that we can be um, capturing and, and sequestering um, carbon, and that, that becomes a sink. The, carbon, the climate solutions, um, you, uh, um, depend, are dependent on the idea that we're starting to use our land as carbon sinks instead of the other way around.